morning to our students, staff, and all of our distinguished guests. My name is Dr. David Glasner. I'm the superintendent of the Shaker Heights City School District. I first want to thank Megan Jones of the 9-11 Memorial and Museum for coordinating this special event with Callie Lykin, a senior here at Shaker Heights High School. Megan herself actually attended Shaker and is a member of the class of 1997. Thank you, Megan, for coming home to help our audience of students, most of whom weren't yet born in 2001, to better understand the events of that terrible day. Everyone who is old enough to remember September 11th, 2001, has a personal story to share, whether it's about who you about where you were, about who you were with, or what you stopped doing at the moment you learned of the attacks. Each of us has a story. At the time, I was in my early 20s and preparing to spend a year abroad. I was flying out of New York City two weeks after September 11th, so I decided to visit Ground Zero before leaving. The scene of the devastation that I witnessed there left an indelible memory. Even so, those images aren't the ones that I keep at the top of my mind. When I returned to the States a year later, I started my career in New York City and lived there for the next 12 years. I literally watched the city come alive again and rise from the ashes. And in many ways, our host and your peer, Callie, is a human representation of that. Callie was born on September 11, 2001 in New York City. While she has no memory of that day, she and her parents, Jonathan and Erica, remain forever connected to it. So throughout her life, Callie has tried to understand what September 11th means to her and to others. Just last spring, she visited the 9-11 Memorial, and for her, the experience was life-changing. It spurred Callie to reach out to Megan Jones to help her bring this presentation to you today so that the next generation can understand September 11, 2001, as Callie does now. Thank you, Callie, for all of your work in coordinating this special assembly as an educational ambassador for the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. And now, please welcome Callie Lykin. Thank you, Dr. Glasner. As many of you may know, I was born 18 years ago today in New York City. My mom, eight and a half months pregnant with me, walked about five miles from ground zero where the towers had just fallen to my parents' apartment on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. I was born by emergency C-section at 5.15 p.m. that afternoon. My birth on that dark day gave my parents hope. But for me, it wasn't until this summer when I visited the 9-11 Memorial Museum for the very first time that I really understood the loss of that day and the incredible bravery shown by so many people in the middle of so much danger. It wasn't until my visit to the memorial that I came to understand the role that we can play, especially those of us who are seniors this year who were born right around the time of 9-11. To my classmates here today, our lives started just as the lives of so many ended, just as terrorism became part of everyday life here in America. As the children born at this time, we can play a special role in the mission of the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. We can help deliver a powerful message that the lessons of 9-11 are not only a part of the past, but an important part of our future work as a community. Here's how we can do this. The way to make sure that something like 9-11 never happens again is to remember and tell the story. The way to make sure that we honor the victims is to say their names. On this day I visited, I placed a flower on the name of Elena Sesanova, whose birthday was that day. The way to make sure that we honor the bravery and kindness of the first responders is to say thank you and those who continue to serve our community in these important jobs. Thank you to our police and fire representatives here today. I hope to do this work in some way for the rest of my life. And I hope that each of us as classmates will be moved as I was by the story and by what we can do together to make the world safer and to heal and to remember. Thank you. I would now like to introduce the mayor of Shaker Heights, Mayor David Weiss. Good morning, and thank you, Callie. I'm pleased to be here on this important day 
As we gather to recognize the significance of the 9-11 events in your personal life, this National Day of Service and Remembrance is also an important day for all of us in the city of Shaker Heights, as it allows us an opportunity to honor and remember the first responders who answered the call of duty on that tragic day with courage, tenacity, grace, and humility. The city is also honored to have former Mayor Earl Lycan uh, join us today on this uh, solemn occasion. As part of today's remembrance, the city of Shaker Heights extends its recognition to all first responders through the representation of our own public safety personnel. Proudly joining us today are Shaker Heights Police Chief Jeffrey DeMuth and Shaker Heights Fire Chief Pat Sweeney. First responders are also represented uh, by both our police and fire guards, um, including Laura Clegg, William Wedeking, Matthew Lewis, Brianna Meredith, Parker Adrian from the police department, and Tim Wolf, Mike Hageman, and Kyle Nelson from the fire department. On this anniversary, I invite, I invite all of you to pay tribute to the fallen first responders by honoring their memory and bravery, by maintaining silence during the presentation of the colors. It is a small but meaningful way to show our gratitude for their heroism, spirit of service, and self-sacrifice so nobly demonstrated on September 11, 2001. And now, if you will, please stand if you are able and remove your hats for the presentation of the colors by the Shaker Heights Police and Fire Department's Honor Guard, followed by the national anthem as presented by the members of the Cleveland Orchestra and the Shaker Heights High uh, School Audit, uh, Orchestra.
I would now like to introduce Megan Jones, the Senior Director of Education at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. Thank you, Mayor Weiss, Dr. Glasner, Callie, students and faculty of Shaker Heights High School. It is an honor and a privilege to be back at my, at my old high school with you on this very important day. As I look out at all of you here today, I can't help but be transported back to September 11th, 2001, because on that morning, I was not much older than you. Having just graduated from Ohio University, I was about to embark on the next chapter of my life, the same as many of you who will soon be graduating. Not quite sure what was next, but excited to find out. That morning was like any other. I was in the last week of my summer job before starting graduate school when one of my coworkers said, hey, did you hear a plane hit the World Trade Center? I immediately thought it must have been a tragic accident and went back to my work folding clothes. By the time I was done, a second plane had hit the South Tower. And by the time I was able to get to a TV, the first image I saw was smoke coming out of the Pentagon. I will never forget that image because that was when I knew we were under attack. I was living in Columbus at the time and immediately drove to my aunt's house, frantic to find out if my cousin Brian, who worked directly across the street from the World Trade Center and got off the subway at that station every morning, was okay. That morning was the first day of school in New York City and he had dropped off his eight-year-old daughter at school while his wife, pregnant with twins, was at home in Hoboken, New Jersey, just across the Hudson River from Manhattan. It would take over eight hours to learn that in fact, he had survived the collapse of both towers, thanks to a complete stranger, a young college student who offered him a place to stay at his dorm room at NYU. Brian's story is one of many stories of kindness that came out of tragedy. It is stories like my cousin's that are core to the mission of the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. Stories that keep the memory of the 2,983 victims alive. That help us remember and help us bridge the gap between what is history for most of you and a lived experience for others. You will now hear from people who were there that day. A first responder, survivor, a journalist, a family member, and military personnel. People willing to return to the World Trade Center site to share their stories so that the legacy of 9-11 is not forgotten. Thank you. Hello. Welcome to Anniversary in the Schools, a program commemorating the anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. You are joining hundreds of thousands of other students from around the world to remember what happened here, right where I'm standing at the foundations of the World Trade Center. Today, the space is occupied by the 9-11 Memorial Museum. Today, you're gonna hear from five individuals with extraordinary stories to share. Stories that took place here and at the Pentagon outside of Washington, D.C. Stories of loss, of survival, of heroism. And you're going to hear from students who were born after the attacks, just like I imagine you were. Before we hear from them, though, we're going to play a short film that highlights the six key times that mark the 9-11 attacks. These are the moments that mark our day. Thank you again for participating. It is up to us, all of us, to remember what happened here and to understand why it's still important. And we hope this program helps you do that. Good morning. 64 degrees at 8 o'clock. It's Tuesday, September 11th. I'm Lee Harris. Here's what's happening. Tuesday, September 11th, 2001. An ordinary day in New York City. At 8.46 a.m., that normalcy ends suddenly when hijackers from the terrorist group Al-Qaeda deliberately crash American Airlines Flight 11 into the 110-story North Tower at the World Trade Center. First responders immediately rush to help. Dispatch, Ken Brown, line of three. I'm at the World Trade Center. Yeah. I'm on the 35th floor. Okay? Okay. Just related to command post. There's new, uh, we're trying to get up. You know, there's numerous civilians at all stairwells. Numerous burn injuries are coming down. I'm trying to send them down first. Apparently, it's above the 75th floor. I don't know if they got there yet, okay? Okay. It's a free truck and we're still heading up, all right? Okay. Thank you. 
All 11 firefighters responding from FDNY Ladder Company 3, including Captain Patrick Brown, would be killed that morning. 441 first responders die as a result of the attacks, the largest loss of emergency personnel in American history. Just 17 minutes later at 9.03 a.m., it becomes clear that this is a deliberate attack when hijacked United Flight 175 crashes into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. At 9.37 a.m., a third hijacked plane, American Flight 77, is flown directly into the Pentagon, headquarters of the United States Department of Defense in Arlington, Virginia. Back in Lower Manhattan, at 9.59 a.m., the unimaginable happens. The South Tower collapses. Meanwhile, a fourth hijacked plane heads toward Washington, D.C. Passengers and crew aboard United Flight 93 learn from phone calls about the attacks that have already occurred. With this information, the passengers and crew storm the cockpit. In response, the hijackers crash the plane in an empty field outside Shanksville, Pennsylvania, just 20 minutes from Washington, D.C. All aboard are killed. Back in New York City at 10.28 a.m., the North Tower collapses 102 minutes after being struck. On September 11th, 2,977 people from over 90 nations are killed. I feel like for 9-11, the role for the first responders is to get the people out of there and just do the best they can. Their job is basically thinking about everybody else. Their job is saving lives. So I want to know what were they thinking on the way to the towers? Thanks to them, there's people that survive. I would ask a survivor what was going through their minds at the time and what their first instinct was. Good morning, my name is Frank Rosano and I am a World Trade Center survivor. Right between the two World Trade Center towers was a hotel. And I would always stay there because it was very close to the courthouse. I was here on the evening of September the 10th. I had just come into town. Uh, I was getting ready and preparing for a trial, but it must have been around 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I heard a huge bang. And I got up out of bed. Uh, I uh, walked to the uh, window and I saw there were papers fluttering uh, to the ground. I didn't know that in fact that big uh, banging sound was the first plane going into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Maybe 15, 20 minutes later I heard this time an explosion. I uh, again pulled the drapes back and this time I saw fireballs falling into the street. At this point, I knew that there was something going on, and I turned the TV on, and I saw Matt Lauer saying that two planes had flown into the World Trade Center. And if you're just joining us, it's both towers of the World Trade Center in New York City, where two planes have crashed into the towers, one shortly before 9 o'clock Eastern time. On 9-11, I was working in my firehouse 74 engine at 120 West 83rd Street. And on the morning of 9-11, we were dispatched after the second plane hit. We got on the rig, and our responsibility was to respond to the Marriott Hotel on West Street. As ridiculous as it sounds, uh, in retrospect, uh, I went in, I took a shower, brushed my teeth, shaved uh, and got dressed. By the time I was done doing that, I was looking at the TV and uh, the uh, Matt Lauer was saying, well, it's a terrorist attack. We had just started to check the rooms in the south end of the hotel and all of a sudden the building started rumbling. I could feel the building breaking up around me and I remember thinking to myself that um, these are probably the last few moments of my life and that I would probably never see my daughter who had just gotten engaged get married. Only in a matter of a 
second or two seconds, uh, everything went black. Uh, couldn't see, couldn't hear. What had happened was that the first tower had collapsed. And as the dust settled, directly in front of us was a wall of debris from the floor to the ceiling, from wall to wall. We couldn't proceed down that hallway. Every floor we hit was exactly the same. We'd come out of the stairs. There'd be only two rooms there that we could knock on the doors or search. I made my way out uh, to, the, <clears throat> to the hallway. I <clears throat> yelled out, is anyone there? And I heard a voice. At that point, I ran into three civilians, Frank Rosano, a guy from another employee of the Marriott, and another gentleman. As we got down to the lower floors, we could not proceed further down the stairs, but we weren't at the main level, we weren't at the lobby level. I was up front, I made my way in this big room, there were these huge columns, it looked like maybe a catering hall that could fit hundreds of people or whatever with tall ceilings, but the ceilings were partially collapsed, the staircase there was completely blocked. At that point, the building started shaking violently, so I yelled, get to the columns because these columns were approximately maybe eight feet in diameter and there were multiple ones in the room. And uh, as, as this was happening, I said, just don't let me go like this. And for some reason, I thought of my daughter. Literally everything in that room fell on top of us. When that stopped, we burrowed our way out of the debris. Again, Jeff took charge. I could see a little bit of light through this hole, but we were still not at street level. There were these curtains that were against all of the windows. And I said, the only way I can think of doing this is if we hold on to the curtains and go feet first and lower yourself holding on to the curtains the first guy that went out was the guy uh, that worked at the Marriott. He fell a little bit, but he made it. And then the other gentleman went out. We make our way across West Street uh, in the debris pile. We get to the other side of the street, and Jeff met another fireman. Uh, and he, says to, he said to us, I want the three of us who were with him I want you to walk over to the Hudson River. He said, I'm going with this other fireman. That was the last I saw of Jeff on that day. I received a phone call from the editor of the New York Post, and they said I had won the, the first ever Liberty Medal for heroism for 9-11, because of what happened on 9-11. My nephew called me up on the phone and said, Uncle Frank, uh, there's a story in the New York Post about a fireman who won the Liberty Medal. And he says, it sounds just like your story. I got a phone call from a woman, and uh, she said, are you Jeff Johnson? I said, yes. She goes, are you a fireman from, uh, were you involved in 9-11? I said, yes. She goes, please hold and it was Frank Rosano. He goes, you don't know who I am. He goes, but you saved my life. When I got, first got him on the phone, he said, I says, you know, first thing I want to tell you is I apologize for that story. I know it made me sound like uh, James Bond and I'm some kind of hero. And I, I stopped him and I said, Jeff, I said, you are my hero. I said, there is no way in the world that I would ever crawl down that rug that you threw over the side of the building unless you had shown me the way. My uh, daughter had just gotten engaged just before 9-11. And when it came time for the wedding, I said to my wife, I said, you know, I feel like I'm only here because of Jeff. I want to invite him to the wedding. And uh, my wife agreed, my daughter agreed, and we did. The minute I saw him, I remembered him. But I mean, this is a perfect stranger that, you know, we went through this life-altering experience and now we're together again. I have stayed in touch with him 
and I will always be indebted to him uh, for what uh, he did for me. I never considered what uh, municipal policemen and firemen did on a daily basis until that moment, and I realized what a sacrifice these men make, and women, every single day. I honestly do not know uh, what makes somebody want to run into danger. I kind of knew I liked helping people when they were hurt. When somebody's in an emergency or somebody's in trouble and they call a fireman, all we want to do is just help. I knew I didn't want to do anything else. As a reporter, you have to keep the world informed, but as well, you have to keep yourself safe. What was the most difficult thing you had to do in that moment? And how does it affect you personally? How hard was it for them to stay safe and close enough to continue reporting? We were interviewing Major Giuliani. We were at City Hall, everything was ready, cameras were set, and they were like, uh, there's something going on, uh, Twin Towers, you guys need to go now. Back on the days was Humberto Acosta, uh, my photographer, and Orestes Telles, that was our truck operator. We jumped into the truck and we were driving, and we just saw this massive, <laughs> crazy thing going on, like, People were running the other way, cars were getting the other way, and it was, like, it was like massive chaos. We made it right to the corner, and in seconds, I don't know, minutes, we just went live. And um, if you want to call it tunnel vision, I think that's what they called when you are good in live shots because you just close and forget about the rest. I swear for my kids that I didn't hear when that tower explode. I guess I was so focused in what I was doing that I couldn't hear anything. It was something inside me that I couldn't understand when he said run. It was not just run because we need to work. It was run because you need to run because there's something bad happening behind and we need to save our lives. And I looked and I saw the famous monsters that people talk like dust and debris and and darkness and it was like from day to night like everybody said and we were just walking around walking around like zombies if you want to call it looking for stories if you ask me today we were crazy we were looking for stories i guess it's the adrenaline and our way to cope with what was happening the police officer were like you guys got to get out of here, nothing new, they're always kicking journalists out. And we were running the other way, escaping from where they're telling us to get out. They were telling us out, and we were in the other way. But then after that, guess what? Another explosion. And then Humberto was, run, let's run. But he never stopped taping. I remember somebody asked us, uh, Guys, we don't know when you guys gonna be uh, will be able to get out of there. We're happy that you guys are alive. We don't know when. I'm sorry. Uh, but we will send another crew to replace you guys as soon as we can. And in a normal day, we were happy to see that we were off the shift. But then Umberto was like, "What? No." We are here working. Don't worry, you don't have to set another crew. We know that we're stuck, but we are working. And um, we continue working until his batteries die. And if I can say something about 9-11 as a journalist, it's like we learn that we journalists, that reporters on the field, that we're human too. We need to remember. We need to remember how we were in the past years after that, the first two, three years where everybody was welcoming. It doesn't matter from what part of the country you were coming of this world, you were welcome. And I think we need to take the goodness of 9-11, which is we all were equal, we were, were humans, and we all care for each other. And I would love to see that again. 
usually when you think about 9-11, you just think about the Twin Towers and not the Pentagon. So I definitely feel like that needs to be talked about way more. If I was to talk to someone that was working in the Pentagon that day, I would probably ask them if they thought that their life was gonna end at that point. At that moment that you think about your future, I was on a staff tour at the Pentagon as a director uh, of resources and plans. It was a, a nice fall day in Washington, D.C. Some of the, the folks that worked for me were watching the uh, news that day. And uh, about 9 o'clock that morning, they came in, uh, into the office and got me and said, hey, a plane flew into the Trade Center in uh, New York City. Kathy worked for me. I was a director, and Kathy was a manpower analyst in our manpower division. Uh, and had been there for many years. On the morning of September 11th, I was in the Pentagon, at my desk in the Pentagon, when I received a call from my sister Patty. My baby sister Patty and I both worked in the Pentagon. That morning we met. There's a five-acre courtyard in the center of the Pentagon, so we'd meet there. Now, before we met out in the center court, we both knew what happened in New York City. So we decided afterwards that Perhaps we better get going back to our offices to see what the next step was, if, they were go if we were going to have to evacuate. We had no idea what was going on, except that things weren't normal. As I was walking down the hall, I heard a loud sound, got knocked down. A bunch of debris came flying down the hallway, and I covered my face. I got halfway back down to my office, and all of a sudden there was a big jolt in the uh, Pentagon. And and where I had been there, where General Maud's office, that's uh, right where the airplane hit the building. And then immediately, a quarter four, <coughs> which I was walking down, filled with uh, smoke. People were fumbling around in the smoke. They were misoriented. As we started running down the hall away from the sound of the impact and the debris flying in the air, the firewall shut on us. That was the first time I was so afraid. I was afraid. So we, we stayed behind the firewall until, actually, my, my co-worker, my boss, Mr. Lewis, was able to unjam a door near us, and several of my co-workers were able to force the firewall open. And some of us were out in the hallway then ushering people, orienting them down towards that way so they could get out uh, into the A-ring. While we were out there, one of our co-workers got a group together, and we and we said a prayer, and I kept looking for Patty. I kept telling everybody, look for Patty. And then they led us to the outer perimeter of the building. So we ran out there. When I got home, my phone was ringing off the hook, and I called my folks and said, they need to come up to my place, and I'm home, and we're going to go over to Patty's house, where her husband and daughter are, to wait there for Patty to come home. Immediately uh, after we came to our senses and had searched as far as we could into the fire, we then had to uh, go into the recovery mode and we had to make sure we knew who had perished and who had survived. And we started making calls to identify where all our people were and that continued on into the night until about midnight, and we were pretty sure uh, of what we had. We were within one of identifying who probably did not make it out of the fire. Uh, Lieutenant General Maud was the senior person in the Pentagon killed that day. He was my boss. Finally, eight days after September 11th, my sister was identified. My brother-in-law called up my family to come to the house that the admiral, to tell us that the admiral would be coming over. And I, I, I knew what that meant. They identified Patty. We lost 29 civilian and military people in our staff sections. Those are 29 hardworking, well-meaning, citizens of the United States who are supporting their family, supporting their government, and our true professionals. A year after 
the attacks, they had a celebration at the Pentagon Daycare Center of the Butterfly Garden. It was to memorialize my sister and another mother who had a daughter at the daycare center. And when I would return to work, whenever I had issues that I couldn't deal with or whatever, I missed Patty so much. All I had to do was go out to that butterfly garden and remind her of how many people loved her. As much hatred and anger there was, there was an abundance of love from people helping us out, letting us know they were there. There is a camaraderie there and you support each other. It is something that bonds you for the rest of your life. And I come to work uh, every day, still in the Pentagon now, and uh, I think of them. So you take on a responsibility to carry on the mission in their memory, as they would if something had happened to you. I feel like it's important to learn about this because it's history. It's a way for us to connect and it's a way for us to educate ourselves. Younger generations will actually have a clear idea of what's going on. Just by you talking about it with your teachers and your peers, it definitely makes an impact. Today, you heard stories from people who chose to translate tragedy into extraordinary acts of compassion, demonstrating that one person can make a difference. Their stories of selflessness, resolve, and resilience affirm what unites us rather than what divides us. The story of 9-11 belongs to all of us. So now the question is, what will you do with it? Share your thoughts and ideas using the hashtag 9-11 Museum Ed. Together, we'll show that a collection of small actions can create something extraordinary. was about nine months in the making. Um, I mentioned earlier that, <clears throat> that these people shared of their time, their stories, and their families. And what I mean by that is that for many of them, that was the first time they had ever come back to New York and had ever stepped inside the museum. So as you hear these people talk, keep in mind the bravery that it takes to share that story on camera and to go back to the site of where this tragedy occurred. Every year we do this and every year I am further impressed by the people willing to share their stories. I thought I'd share just a couple of things that happened behind the scenes before I open it up to any questions that you may have. One I want to share is uh, Jeff Johnson, the FDNY firefighter who spoke. He had never been back to the museum. He doesn't like to share his story and he had never told his story to his daughter. So on that day when he came to the museum, I met him outside, it was 5.30 in the morning in May, and he said, can I bring my daughter? And I said, of course. So his daughter came, she's an ATF agent now, and we walked downstairs, and he started to tell his story, and she was standing next to me. And there was that part when he got a little choked up when he talked about thinking about his daughter, because as he was telling his story, he was looking right at her. And she said to me, this is the first time I've ever heard my dad tell this. Thank you for giving us this opportunity for our family to heal. And that's just one of the unexpected things that comes out of a program like this and working in a museum like this. The other story that I'll share is that Kathy and uh, Mark had not seen each other in over 10 years until they happened to be filming on the same day. And that flower that Kathy brought for her sister Patty, she brought all the way from her garden in Arlington, Virginia. 
So something to keep in mind today as you go back to class and you go throughout your day, one thing I would ask is there's a small thing that you can do to honor 9-11, and that would be to share just one of the stories that you heard with someone back home, with your family, with, with a friend, just to share those stories, because as I said before, that is how we bridge that gap between history and memory. And that is how we honor the victims, we honor the first responders, we honor the family members, and all of those who came to help in the days after 9-11. So if you have any questions for me, I know it can be very intimidating to stand at a microphone in front of a lot of people, but I'm happy to ask or answer any questions that you may have about you know, me, the work of the museum, the program that you saw. Um, so if anyone would like to ask a question, I'm happy to answer. And if not, that's okay too. Because I know one of the questions was about my story. So I can start with that. And then again, there are two microphones here. So if anybody has a question, you can come on up and don't be afraid to ask. Um, I did share a little bit of my story early on. But uh, as I said, on that day, I was getting ready to go to graduate school. I was working at a mall in Columbus called Easton. And I was working in retail, it was my last week, and I was folding clothes when my colleague came, or my coworker said to me that a plane had hit. And again, I had no idea what was really going on until I managed to run across uh, to a bank that had a television. And I saw a, a wide shot of Washington, D.C., the iconic Washington Monument. Lincoln Memorial, and then behind that, a big plume of uh, black smoke. And that's when I knew that, again, as I said, that we were under attack, that something was different. And so I immediately ran to a phone to call my aunt to find out about Brian, and we didn't know where he was. Um, any of you who <clears throat> remember that day, remember that you know it was hard to get a signal, it was hard to get through to people, and so we had no idea where Brian was. We had no idea where his eight-year-old daughter was. But we knew that his wife, who we were able to get in touch with, had watched what happened from her window in Hoboken. So I got into my car. I ran over to my aunt's house. And I spent the next two days at their house. We didn't move. We had the TV on. All day, I called my mom, my dad. My brother and sister were actually in middle school here in Shaker. And I knew that everyone in my family was OK, but we were all trying to find Brian. Now, this was something that later on he didn't talk about ever, until about 2005. I went to visit New York for the very first time, and I met Brian in his office in Midtown, and we were driving back to New Jersey where they lived, and he just started talking to me. And I didn't really know what to do. I mean, what do you do when someone starts to describe for you what they saw? And I realized all I could do was listen. But he was there that day, got out of the train, saw the second plane hit the South Tower, tried to get into his office building, and then when the towers collapsed, you saw the images from Sophia's story, he became trapped in the dust cloud. So he just went running down the street, he tripped and fell, and he thought the only thing he could do was lay as close as he could to the curb so that no one would step on him. So he was laying on the ground, covered in dust and debris, uh, didn't know what was going to happen. His mouth was full of all of that debris, had trouble breathing, and felt a hand reach out to him. Opened his eyes, he had to wipe all of the dust out of his eyes, looked up and he saw a young man who said, come with me. So he took his hand and they just started to run. And they ran uptown to the East Village where the campus of NYU is. And he said, here, come stay with me. And they stayed in that room at NYU. He was able to get a phone call through. And again, that's when we knew eight hours later that he was OK. But it took him five years, or four years, to actually tell me that story. And he actually kept the suit he was wearing. So in the back of his closet was a suit, still covered in dust, that he said he couldn't get rid of. He didn't know why. He couldn't do it. He had to keep it. And he kept it for the rest of his life. So while my story, I wasn't in New York, but I felt a connection to that day, and I had no idea that just you know, years later, I would end up at the museum telling stories like this to make sure that, again, a generation with no memory doesn't forget what happened. And not just the tragedy, but the kindness. What that stranger did. You hear it in the, in the webinar, strangers, people who didn't know each other at all, stepping up to help. Because at the end of the day, 9-11 is a tragic story, 
but it's also a story of humanity. It's the story of our shared humanity. It didn't matter where you were from, what you looked like. This was an attack on humanity, and everyone came together to help in any way they could that day and in the days and months that followed. So that is my story. Um, are there any questions? Ah. Um, can you tell us more about the work of the museum and how it is helping to uh, uh, us to understand the lessons we can learn from 9-11? Sure. So the work of the museum. So my first day at work was not a, a usual or typical day because I showed up to work in a hard hat and construction boots because I started before the museum opened. Um, so to give you an understanding of the evolution of our programs and what we do, I, my background is I was actually a classroom teacher for five years um, at Centerville, Ohio, which is near Dayton. And then I moved to Washington, D.C., and I worked at the National Archives and the Supreme Court. And I wasn't looking for a job, um, but I was always interested in difficult history and how to talk about challenging content. So one day I went on the 9-11 Memorial website because I wondered, how in the world are they going to teach this kind of content to young people? It's challenging. There are so many different layers. It's not just the tragedy of the day, but the repercussions of 9-11 and how the world has changed. And it has changed for the good, and also it has changed in some ways that were negative in the days after. And so how do you talk about that? So I was on the website and I saw that there was an opening for a job. And so I thought, why not? I mean, let me ask my husband. We had just bought a house. We were not in any, we were not thinking at all about moving. And I said to him, I said, what do you think about New York? And luckily he's very relaxed. I am not, I am a very type A person. He is very relaxed. He said, sure, why not? Let's sell our house and move. So we moved there. And I remember going down the first day and seeing it under construction. And I thought I was ready for this. And when I saw the education center, it was just bare walls and some desks. And they said, OK, Megan, this is your space. And that was when it hit me, the truly awesome responsibility that I had to, to tell this story, to honor the victims, and to do it right. So it's an evolving process. I mean, this history is still writing itself. and so. The first thing that we did was we realized we needed to serve not just students, but also teachers. Because it's in the classroom where you're going to have these conversations. I mean, we'll have students with us for an hour and a half, but it's the teachers that are going to get the difficult questions. So what we do is we offer many different programs. We have field trips, and they are on topics, everything from the events of the day, which is, of course, the most popular, all the way to the repercussions of 9-11. And this is where we get into the issues of how the world has changed and connect it to current events. We talk about history and memory and the idea of memorials and what are memorials and what, is, what do they mean and what do they represent. We also offer you know, professional development for teachers because I speak to teachers a lot. And I ask them, what is the most challenging part of teaching this content? And they say the same four things, no matter where I go, whether I'm in New York or California or Ohio, they say it's too emotionally difficult for me to talk about, or it's too complex. Where do I start? How do I answer the question, who did this and why? Where does the story start? How do I do this? I also get the question about, um, there's not enough time. I have to meet standards, it's, I don't have enough time to talk about it, so I don't know how to, how to do it in a short amount of time. And then there's this fourth category that I like to call other, which are all the other things that people will mention anywhere from, again, having it be too personal to I don't want to offend anybody. And so <clears throat> we do a lot of programming around how to have these conversations in the classroom. And then we also do education programs for law enforcement. So this is something that is very interesting. We have a lot of, so for example, every FBI agent who is going through Quantico through training comes to the museum. And at first I thought, wow, this is really interesting. I wonder you know, why they want to do this. And then it dawned on me, oh, this makes sense. Because most of the people who are training to be FBI agents probably barely have a memory of 9-11 at this point. I mean, as I look around here, again, as Callie mentioned, most of you were just born or weren't alive yet. And so we do a lot of education with law enforcement, CIA, FBI, NSA, that will come because they understand that the work that they're doing ties back to something that happened 18 years ago. They understand that their mission is driven to protect this country because they will recognize, and if you read the 9-11 Commission report, it says 
that this happened, this attack happened because it was a failure of imagination, that they couldn't even comprehend planes being used as weapons to take buildings down. And so that's just a basic sort of idea of the things that we do in terms of our education programs. And to me, most importantly, is connecting with young people. And I think the way that you do that is through storytelling. Because you can say that 2,977 people were killed on 9-11, but when you hear the story of Patty Mickley and her sister Kathy, there's a connection. And the second thing I would say is connecting it to today. Helping young people understand that something that seems like history 18 years ago actually directly impacts the world that we're living in today in ways you may not see. And you're getting ready to inherit this world. You're getting ready to inherit these difficult questions. So understanding how what happened then connects to today is um, another way that we address um, education in our programs. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Um, how did you organize the 9-11 Museum in a way that honors every life lost? Okay, so how did we organize the museum in a way that honors the victims um, that were killed? Excellent question. There's a lot of different ways, but I'll highlight just a few. Um, one is outside of the museum, on the memorial. So I know you saw that picture earlier of Callie placing the rose in the name. So when you visit the memorial, there are two very large pools. And the title for the submission that won the competition to design the memorial it's called reflecting absence. So everything that you see there ties back to this idea of absence and reflection. So when you see, when you go to the pools, for example, when you look down, you can't actually see the bottom. The water continues to flow. And that represents this idea of this infinite or endless sadness. The tragedy, it's in the, the sadness and the feeling continues on. There is no end to that. But then that's juxtaposed with the trees that you see on the plaza. And now those trees are calorie pear trees, and they come from within a 500-mile radius of all three attack sites. So you have this absence, but then you have this idea of growth and moving forward through the trees. Now, on the parapets are the names. So this is one way we honor each victim. Every single victim from both 2001 and 1993 is represented on the parapets, but you don't actually see their names. Their names are missing. They're carved into the parapets, and then at night, light shines up through, and the light comes up through their names up to the sky. So again, this idea of reflecting absence. What's really interesting about the way the names are arranged, though, is most people think it's alphabetical, but it's not. The names are arranged through something that's called meaningful adjacencies. So what that means is that every family member had the opportunity to request certain people be next to each other. So for example, it may not be that they were related by family, but they may have been coworkers and they were together when they, when they passed. Or there's a story of one woman who lost her father on one of the flights and her best friend who was in the North Tower and she wanted her father and her best friend together. So all of the requests were submitted and then uh, MIT came up with an algorithm to match all of the adjacencies because it wasn't just that the names were organized by the adjacency, but they also had to be organized by where they were when the towers fell and where they were killed. And then they wanted all of the first responders together on the South Pool. So there were a lot of variables to try to make this arrangement and I'm very happy to say that every single request was honored. So if you ever go there and you visit and you see the names, there is a relationship between all of the people that were together. One other way that we honor each victim is inside the museum. There's a very large blue wall when you get down to bedrock. <clears throat> and there's a quote that says, no day shall erase you from the memory of time, from the epic poem, The Aeneid. And you see 2,983 watercolor paintings. And they're all different shades of blue. And the artist, Spencer Finch, um, has created 2,983 custom mixes of blue, so no two colors are the same. And that's because no two people are the same. Everybody is unique, everybody is their own shade of color, and so you see them placed, and behind them is a metal grate, and that symbolizes the missing posters that were all over New York on top of the chain link fences. And it's blue, because the piece is called Trying to Remember the Color of the Sky on that September morning. Any pictures you ever see from that day, or if you talk to anyone who was there, they remember the blue sky. 
it was a very clear blue day. And so that is another way that each victim is honored. Next to that is the memorial exhibition where there is a photograph of all of the victims, and those are in alphabetical order. And inside that exhibition, you can hear personal stories of each victim as told by a family member or friend, because it's important to remember the lives they lived and who they were as people, not just how they died. Thanks. As um, like my grade, mm -hmm. like we were all born in like 2003, 2004. How can we establish a personal connection to 9/11 without actually being there to experience it or hearing like stories from family members who were there or family members who witnessed it? Okay, that's a great question. So, how can you connect to 9/11 if you weren't alive or hadn't been born? You know, we talked about again listening to the stories, which is one way. There are a lot of different ways. I mean, I think about. Um, for example, what we're doing here today, I mean, this is because one of your classmates wanted to understand and have a deeper connection to her birthday and wanted to do something to share with her colleagues the experience, or her uh, classmates, what she had experienced in New York. So one way is through, obviously, you know, this is a very deeply personal connection. I would say the stories is the other, finding a person and learning their story and realizing, again, that shared humanity, that we're all humans, and that this happened to human beings, to real people. For example, there were victims from over 90 nations, all religions, all backgrounds. In fact, if you go on the Memorial website and you type in, for example, there's a name finder tool, if you type in Ohio, you're going to find victims from Ohio. There is another connection just geographically that this event touched this community I'm sure if you ask people in the community, they will tell you their stories, and I'm sure they have connections as well. So another way, beyond just the personal stories, is to think about how this event touched your own home, your own hometown. Um, another is in terms of current events in the world that we live in today, if there's an issue that you're passionate about, if there's a cause that you're interested in. You know, thinking about how history impacts and this event impacts the world we live in today is another way that you might find a personal connection to something that perhaps you didn't live through. So those are just a few examples of how you may find a connection even though you weren't alive for it um, and, and didn't experience it yourself. Um, I think this is the last question. So, yes. um, so we keep saying how like most of us weren't alive and most of us um, were either born like right after or right before. Um, so we only know the world after. So could you explain a little bit how the world has changed because sure. of this event? Sure, so how the world has changed, like how much time do you have? That's a very, that's a, that's a big, yeah, that's a big question. No, it's a good question and I'm glad that you're asking that. Um, you did say that you know about the post 9-11 world and one thing I will say in terms of education programs, one thing that I didn't think about as much as I should have when we started developing the programs in the museum is that I forgot that you don't know the world before 9-11. So how can you talk about how the world has changed if you don't know what the world was like before, right? Because like walking through security, that's not anything that's unusual, right? I mean, when you come to the, the memorial, <clears throat> and if any of you have ever been there, you know this, it's like going through airport security. You have to take off your belt, you have to take, put your bags through magnetometers, you're scanned. Um, that wasn't always the case in public spaces. So um, it's important to talk about what it was like before. I mean, I remember um, my grandma came to visit one time and we went right up to the gate and, and welcomed her at the airport. I mean, you can't do that anymore. You can't go past security. So those are obvious changes, right? Things like airport security, I, you know, I hear that a lot, or security in buildings. Um, but there's, there's a lot of other changes. I mean, <clears throat> the way that, that people look at each other and treaty, treated each other after 9-11. This, this, as Sophia talked about, this unity, this compassion, this coming together. You know, I, at the museum we have a lot of speakers that come and talk, and one speaker recently was Associate Justice Sonia Sotomayor, and when she was speaking, she talked about how, you know, I wish we could go back to the, those days after 9-11 in the sense of unity and compassion and kindness. And I don't know how to get there, but it shouldn't take a tragedy for us to get there. And I think about that a lot, you know. So one of the, the changes is just remembering what happened and trying to hearken back to a time when it, when it was just about being people, being human, being kind, and being compassionate. Um, there are other changes, like a lot of times when I'm working with high school students, they like to ask about national security and civil liberties and this idea of, 
you know, government infringing on rights versus what we need to keep people safe. And that's a really important topic and a really important question that your generation will be grappling with soon enough. I mean, where is that line between keeping us safe versus protecting, you know, your, your rights that are guaranteed to you by the Bill of Rights? That's a very interesting conversation to have that, that we should continue to have. And I will say that 9-11 isn't the first time that debate has come up. You can hearken back to, again, World War II, Chinese Exclusion Act, I mean, there are many times where we've had this conversation, but I would encourage you to think about that. So that's another change. So there's this national security and civil liberties debate. There's, of course, you know, social media and the spread of propaganda and ideas. That, that's a whole different world, and that has changed since 9-11, the way that we communicate and messages are spread. Um, for both good and bad, you know, and how do we handle that? Um, the security in all of our public buildings. But I would, I would offer this to you in thinking about how the world has changed. Think about, again, the goodness and the kindness that comes to in times of tragedy. We have had people come to visit us from so many places asking us what they can do. We've hosted people from Orlando after the Pulse shooting. We've had a French delegation was with us this week about, you know, how do you handle you know, tragedy and building memorials and honoring people. So in this tragedy that happened, good things can come. People do amazing and extraordinary things, and I would hope that you would remember that as you go through your day today. Um, excellent questions. Thank you so much. I wish I had more time, but um, I appreciate you, again, being here and listening, and thank you for your thoughtful questions. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Donna Jellen. I'm the orchestra director here at Shaker Heights High School and the music department chair. Um, we are very thrilled to welcome this morning four members of the Cleveland Orchestra. Um, they are Alicia Kells, Youngton Lee, Isabel Troutwine, and Dane Johansson. And they're um, about to perform for us once again. Um, please give them your close attention as they perform for us the Cavatina from Beethoven's String Quartet, Opus 130, in B flat major. Thank you.
So as we sit here today, 2,983 names are being read right now from a podium at the 9-11 Memorial in New York City by the people who loved them. One of the names that is being read is Wells Remy Crowther. On 9-11, Wells was 23 years old, working on the 104th floor of the South Tower of the World Trade Center. Ever since he was a small child, Wells was known to carry a red bandana with him, a present from his father, wherever he went. At the age of 16, Wells became a volunteer firefighter in his hometown of Nyack, New York, and always wore it under his helmet. He always imagined himself eventually leaving his job in finance to become a full-time firefighter. It is unclear exactly where Wells was at 9.03 a.m. when Flight 175 was deliberately flown into the South Tower, but at 9.12 a.m., he left a voice message for his mother, letting her know that he was safe. Unfortunately, that would be the last time his family would hear his voice. Wells' first responder training immediately kicked in, and he began evacuating people from the sky lobby. He continued helping people evacuate when the South Tower collapsed. At least 12 people survived due to his actions. Though Wells died on 9-11, the last hours of his life remained a mystery for months until May 26, 2002, when an article was published by the New York Times referencing a first-hand account of a man in a red bandana helping to evacuate people. His mother, Allison, read that article, and she said, Oh my God, Wells, I found you. South Tower survivors Judy Ween and Ling Young were able to confirm through a photograph that Wells was, in fact, the man in the red bandana. At the dedication of the museum in May of 2014, Allison Crowther, standing with Ling Young, said the following words, It is our greatest hope that when people come here and see Wells's red bandana, they will remember how people helped each other that day, and that they will be inspired to do the same in ways both big and small. This is the true legacy of September 11th. I am reminded of this story every time I'm asked, what can I do to honor the legacy of 9-11? It was what I thought of when I received an email in my inbox this summer from a young woman born on 9-11 who wanted to connect with the memorial and museum to understand the significance of her birthday and discover what she could do to help. And that is why we are here today, because Callie wanted to help, embodying the true legacy of September 11th. In honor of her hard work and dedication to the mission of the 9-11 Memorial and Museum, and on behalf of all of the museum staff in New York, I have a small token of appreciation for you. Inscribed inside are the words, to Callie, with admiration and appreciation for your commitment to 9-11 education and remembrance. We wish you a happy and meaningful birthday. I would like to thank Megan and the team at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum, Ms. Sarah Changelis, Ms. Amy Gray, and Ms. Angela Williams for your work to help plan today's assembly. We could not have put on today's program without your tireless efforts. As we leave today's assembly, hopefully you will take in something new in your understanding of 9-11, the loss and the bravery, and what we can do as young adults to help tell the story. Thank you so much for attending today and for all you will do to carry this story forward. Thank you for remembering. Thank you all for coming today. Um, I invite you to continue the conversation and I invite you to proceed to your third period. Thank you.